So I'm going to do the presentation in English, um, which is a bit weird because everyone speaks French here, so, and everyone will understand me better if I speak uh, French. So I have a, French, a strong French accent when I speak in English, but anyway, there's some people here who doesn't, don't speak French, so I'll do it in English. It's always hard, you know, to speak after Phil Duff, because he's, always, he's such a good storyteller, and it's not easy to come and do a seminar after him, but I'll do my best. Uh, the good thing, though, is um, he swears so much than me, so I can say as many fuck I want, no one will be shocked, so <laughs> I'm happy with that. So I'm going to start the presentation like doing, um, presenting my bars, presenting Mace in New York, and uh, uh, a concept we do as well called Miracle on 9th Street that we do every uh, winter. Talking a bit about Danico, the place I'm opening next month. And after that, uh, I'll talk about uh, flavor um, and inspiration behind drinks. Uh, because in all the bars I work, you know, I, I used to be uh, the beverage director of Experimental Cocktail Club before. So I opened the one in, um, in London, opened the one in New York. And all the drinks we do are like fairly, you know, like conceptual. And we do like a lot of homemade syrup, a lot of homemade bitters, and, um, and a lot of infusions. And I know like, here, uh, by law, you're not allowed to do infusion, so I'll try to, you know, when I give you example of drinks, I'll try maybe to give you some twist to, to do those flavors without doing infusion. So if you don't understand my, understand my accent, just please raise the hand. I don't see you very well because there's so much light in my face, but I'll try to, um, to answer your question. So first, Mace. Uh, Mace is a bar we opened uh, about a year ago in, our, in New York. Um, my first idea for that bar was to, to do um, a bar, the concept with travel, because I travel a lot, and the main inspiration for the drinks I do is flavors I, I, I meet in when I travel. Uh, you know, sometimes you go to a small village and you have like stuff you never tried before, and it gives you a lot of ideas to make it into drinks. But uh, my business partner, partner, Greg Bohm, I don't know if you know him, is the, um, the director of, uh, the owner of Cocktail Kingdom, which is the biggest bower industry in the world. He told me, well, well, it's a bit too much conceptual for his village, so let's change that. And uh, I said, well, let's do spices, because, you know, everyone understands spices, everyone cooks. I mean, not me, but mostly everyone. And... Um, so yeah, it's easy for you know the lambda, the, the lambda customer that come into your bar, and it's sometimes you know it's very hard when you you draw the whole menu with flavors and and words that they don't understand. You don't want to scare them because after that you know they they won't come back. They'll say, oh yeah, it's good, but it's a bit too crazy. So, so spices was was a good point to start the the concept, and um, and then we had to find a name and mace, mace. It's, uh, you know, my, my favorite uh, spice to, to do the, 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 the bar was clove, but you have already clove a club, you have a very good restaurant in London called clove, clove club, so it was out of the way, and mace is um, basically the, the skin that's around the nutmeg, so it's like a red stuff that is all around, and you need, you need around um, 100 kilo of nutmeg to make one kilo of mace, and you need to dehydrate it right away, otherwise you lose all the flavor, so it's like nutmeg, but a bit more peppery and uh, more, yeah, it's a fine spice, it's very good. So we decided on a name and then we went through it. So like very small menu, 12 drinks. And um, so I'm gonna go a bit with the, the picture of the plate. 12 drinks, small menu, but all infusions, all like, um, like flavors that's like a little bit deep. So it's not the type of cocktail you're gonna do at home because you will need the recipes a bit more complicated, but it gives the experience um, something you won't have in, in all the bar, because it's very uh, from that place. So that's the bar, that's the bar. It's, it's a very small place. Uh, we have uh, 48 seats. Uh, we took a bar called, um, I don't know if some of you went to New York before, but it was called Rue 649, and that place was in East Village. It's located in East Village, but on the far east. Uh, it's called Alphabet City. And uh, so Avenue C, Avenue C in 9th Street. We took about that place, uh, that was a jazz club before, and the owner is still our partner, actually, Zach and change it into a, like a design of like a modern spice shop. So this is the menu. So you see, so same again, you know, we are, we're in the middle of East Village and we didn't want to scare too much people, so we tried to do like the name of the drinks are the name of the spices. So you have the Thai chili, that's actually a picture of the first menu, uh, Thai chili, cocoa, chamomile. Chamomile is the drink you have uh, when you enter. The only thing that's, that's different is like 
instead of chamomile syrup, it's a chamomile honey syrup. So you will we use uh, wildflower honey. And um, and the, the the cognac is fat wash. So if you're not familiar with that, a fat wash is when you take the fat. So we we make a butter. We we make a brown butter, brown noisette en français, with some hay, and uh, infuse it in the cognac. And that, obviously, if you infuse it for like an hour or two and, and then serve in a drink, it's going to be super gross because you have like uh, all the fat floating on the surface. So what we do, the fat wash is you put some, the, the spirit in a freezer. And because alcohol doesn't freeze, you know that, but the fat will. So you strain it, and then you have the cognac with all the flavors. So it's a very interesting uh, stuff to do that obviously you're not able to do in Quebec, and, uh, but I hope, really hope that it, it will change because it's very, very nice when you can play with those stuff. And, uh, and a fat wash is something you can only do with spirits because if you do, like we, I had that conversation yesterday with someone who said, oh yeah, but you can do a syrup, fat wash, and I was like, no, because if you do a syrup, the, the, the syrup will freeze as well, so there's no way to strain. So basically your drink, yeah, it's that. It's a, it's a twist on the French 75, but we have like a fat wash and, and a chamomile honey syrup. So again, to go back on the menu, we, uh, we put the name of the drink, the name of the spice. Uh, we don't put brands. We, tr we try to go straight forward and not put too much technique to not scare people. We put the, 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 the glass and then like flavor profiles, you know, and it helps a lot of people. Uh, because, you know, like, we have a, we have a drink called grass, and we, it was with a grass cordial, and I was like, oh, that drink will, is going to be just for bartender, and because we explain it well, people were ordering it a lot. And then, just for the fun, the spice origin, preparation of the drink. So that's the drink you just had, the chamomile. Uh, more example of drinks we have on the menu over there. So it's just 12 drinks, you know, we change, we don't change the whole menu, um, every four months, like a lot of people do, but we change maybe two drinks, and then a month later, three drinks, it's, it changes a lot. Cinnamon drinks. So it's a lot, uh, you see. We, it, and the thing is, like at Mace, we don't have, like, um, we don't have a big, uh, big kitchen, so it's very small, and we're very limited with that, and we're still, uh, we're still able to do uh, those kind of stuff. All right. So that's about Mace. Um, you guys start to serve the meal punch? Okay, cool. Uh, that's the drink coming after. So Miracle on Ninth Street, Miracle on Ninth Street is, uh, so what happened with Mace? You know when you open a bar, you always, um, there's always delay, like construction, like laws and stuff like that. And we arrive, we arrive in December and we're like, you know, December is the busiest time of the year. And we were off, oh, what are we gonna do? We, we could start the construction in December or do a pop-up. And it's actually um, Greg's mother who said, oh, let's do a, a Christmas pop-up. And I was like, fuck, it's a good idea. <laughs> First one, I still have like 50 to go. <laughs> so yeah, no, no, for me it was a good idea because with the style of drink I do, with, you know, you can work on flavors for, for Christmas. So you can work in uh, pine needles, you can work on chestnut and all the stuff we have in December and everyone knows. But I will never, never, ever imagine that that thing will go big. So we changed the. So what we did, I mean, the first year it was very easy because we, you know, we didn't start the construction. So the place we we could staple like shit everywhere, like Christmas trees and and gifts. On we didn't care. It was just for the fun. But then, after after three days opening, there was a line of like people, like 50 meters line, trying to come to the bar. And it became so popular, it became so popular, like people were waiting for two hours in the cold, in the snow, in the rain to get in. And that place, I mean, I'm not, I'm not afraid to talk about numbers, but um, it's, a, it's a very, you saw the picture before, it's a very tiny bar. And um, in one month, in 23 days, we made more than $150,000. It was more than 5,000 average a day. So it will be like, you open the door at 4 p.m. and the place fill in. And it will never stop until like the um, until like one or one or two. It was crazy. Like my main bartender Chase, he made he made over fourteen thousand dollar tips in one month in, in working twenty one days. It was just crazy. But you you sweat, you sweat a lot. You, you just never stop. You, you can't even go to toilets. It's crazy. And the, the bad thing as well, you have to dress like that. <laughs> so it's not it's not you make money. But it's not it's not easy every day. 
So that's the place. Um, so you see, like, here is where we have the space. So I, we, the picture is not that great because it's a small picture, but it's really like the place change. And um, we change the spices, we put Christmas stuff, we put a lot of decoration. It's very, you know, Christmas train up. You know, it's very kitsch, but it's fun. Again, you know, like, with the famous uh, Christmas hat. It's terrible. It's so hot. It's a it's long shift. Again, the, the front of the window. The drinks, that's, that drink is like, actually, the name of that drink, it was a bit hard to put it on the menu. Because, so, the, the name of that drink is YPKA motherfucker. <laughs> uh, you know, all, you, all, you all know that, you know, it's like, it's die hard, uh, it's killing everyone. It's my business partner, Greg, said, well, no, you can't put that name, it's not Christmas. Like, what well, is not Christmas? It's like killing everyone with a Christmas hat on his head. And after, after a long negotiation, I could put it on a menu, and that drink was the most popular one. It's basically, it's a Mai Tai, but um, we infuse all the rums with um, a pumpkin spices, and we do a chestnut or job. Pretty cool. That one um, is called the Christmas tree gimlet. So basically, it's a gimlet, but we do a Christmas tree cordial. So basically, we take the, the, the pine needles and do a cordial with it, so you really have that taste of the Christmas tree. So it's not as uh, it's not the drink that everyone takes, but it's a bit more challenging, I would say. That so that is very particular to um, to New York. So it's not really in New York. It's not really um, a Christmas uh, bar. It's, it's a holiday bar. Why? Because we have a Hanukkah hideaway. So when you have the bar, you have the Hanukkah section, and that's I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a dreidel. So it's a little game that you play. And you know, like, it's a very strong and big uh, Jewish community in, uh, in New York. And if we will do, like, only Christmas, people will say, like, what the fuck? You know, like, what about us? So we did that uh, small, like, Hanukkah section. And, and that was very, very popular. And we did a drink for that. And that's the school Dreidel, Dreidel, Dreidel. So it's like the name of the song. I, 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 to be honest, I'm not very uh, familiar with it. But that, that game, that little thing, that's what they play. And we did a, a tequila infused. Um, with chocolate gilt, uh, old-fashioned style, stirred, and uh, it was a really good drink. He went a lot on, uh, on medias as well. So there, and, and, and Miracle on 9th Street, so basically it was just for the first year, and we were like, okay, now we open maze, but it became so popular, and oh, to be honest, we made so much money in one month that it was not, uh, we had to do it the year later. And, and, and it became bigger and bigger and bigger, like, uh, and we went on TV and stuff like that, and, and, and we start creating a concept, and now it's, um, it started last year, like um, uh, Derek Brown, I don't know if you know him in Washington, is the, the main guy here, he's one of the best bartenders in America, and he, he did it in one of his bar. so obviously it was not called Miracle on 9th Street, but Miracle on uh, Colum Columbia Street, I think, and, maybe. and we did one in Massachusetts, but next year we're going to do it more, we, we, like Cocktail Kingdom is going to start uh, selling packages, uh, we do, we, they're going to start doing their own glass. So we do the own glass, we do, we do like the flute, we, do, we, s we sell packaging basically for bars and uh, that want to do um, that uh, for the winter. And it, to be honest, it's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great way to, to boost your, your sales because if we do like one, two, three months that are not very good with that month of Miracle on Night Street, you're not very, you don't worry about like the, the, the money in the end of the year, so it's pretty cool. I'm actually going to do it uh, in my bar. I'm opening uh, next month in Paris. We'll do it as well. Um, we're going to do it in London uh, with the help of uh, Claire Smith. So it's, it's that, that thing is going to become big. Quickly, I'll just tell you, tell you about uh, Danico. Danico is the next bar I'm opening uh, in Paris. Uh, we open, I don't know if you know, in Paris, the uh, Galerie Vivienne, so there's a very uh, old gallery uh, near Palais Royal. It's, uh, it's, we didn't want to do a concept that was too strong because it's a very old place and we wanted the, the, the place to stay uh, you know, in time. And um, so that place, basically I'm partnering with a friend of mine. They have three restaurants already in Paris called Rocco, Roca and uh, Rococo. And they're opening a big restaurant. We took over like the old um, Jean-Paul Gaultier, you know, the designer uh, shop, and they're opening Daroko. So Daroko will be the restaurant, Danigo will be the bar. I don't tell much more about it because you know, it's not about me yet. So. But we're opening next month in, in June, and it's going to be the same, you know, we, is we, same thing, 12 drinks on the menu, and uh, 
we're going to have a lab, we're going to have a um, centrifuge, we're going to have a rotor app, we're going to have big eyes, and try to play a lot with flavors as well. All right. So now the main part of the, um, the seminars, basically, is um, something I did at Tails uh, two years ago with uh, Alex Cratena and Jack McGurry. It's how do we do that? How we, we take the inspiration? Because, you know, when you, when you, go, you go to Bath, um, you, can be, you can be an amazing bartender and very good host and stuff like that, but creating drinks is not the easiest stuff. Or you can be very good at creating drinks and being, being a shit host and being very bad behind the bar. But it's, it's not an easy thing, and I, I'll talk about it later, but it's not... Um, I encourage people to be to know your classic, to know your bars, to know your customers before starting to go deeper in, into that. But anyway, travels. Um, like uh, Marilyn said, uh, I've been to now. It's going to be like 68 countries. It's going to be 70 soon, and I travel a lot. I've been, you know, I've been backpacking in the whole South America. It's and the good thing with the bartending job is like I keep going on doing that and discovering culture, discovering people, discovering flavors, and, uh, and, and anyway, you, you think you know everything, you think you know, but like some small stuff you can try in, in countries is like unbelievable. The, the Nazca drink is a good example. I mean, Chicha Morada, now it's like become more like wider in a bar community, but when I was traveling in 2007 in Peru, uh, I was, you know, backpacking and taking the bus, sleeping in the, the worst hotel in the, the whole country, but and, and eating in the, in the cheapest restaurant. But every time we ate, they gave us a big jars of a blue thing that was either very good or very gross, called chicha morada. And chicha morada is uh, basically they take like blue corn and macerate it with water, uh, pineapple, green apple, cinnamon, cloves. And they either serve it like very thick or very on crushed ice and very thin. But it's so much flavor into it. And I love it. I love it. it was sometimes I was not eating the, the meal because it was so gross, but that was perfect. And so I wanted to try to, to bring that into a drink, of course, Pisco, that's Peruvian, and make a twist of Pisco Saro into that. And, and in the end, you know, it's not, too, it's not too complicated to do. You just like take a pan and, and do your own syrup. You do a chicha morada, add sugars, like a simple syrup, do that. And it brings a lot of flavors. And it's a small twist that brings the, the drink into a different level because pisco sour is an amazing drink, but you know, you had one, 10, 20, and then you start to get bored of it. And you, you play with that amazing drink with the flavors from the country. And I think it's a pretty good thing. Kinkakuji, that was from a f uh, trip from Japan. Uh, Kinkakuji, for the people who've been there, is like a golden temple. So when you go to Kyoto, of course, there's a lot of temples in Kyoto. It's an amazing place. Kinkakuji is a golden temple. And that is a meal punch. Uh, so meal punch is like one of my favorite things to do. It's, of course, again, here it's something that's a bit complicated to do, but you take a lot of spirits and juice and stuff like that. You take milk. And you, when you curdle the milk, it's going to create kind of mud. And actually, I think you had already the second drink. Yeah, that, the second drink is a milk punch as well. So you, 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 take the, you, you take the milk, and then you strain it into a super bag. Super bag is like used a lot in, in a kitchen. So it's like basically a big filter. And you have um, either like very tiny hole or big hole, but it's the, you calculate that in micron. It's called micron. So 250 microns is the one that's pretty cool. And, uh, and you filter it, and that, that casein from the milk, we create a filter, like kind of mug, and when you run the whole punch through it, it's going to clarify it, like you do like for spirits or wine and stuff like that. And it creates drinks with layers that are very interesting. And for your bar, it's even, even cooler, because you, you have to, to create like a milk punch, you have to do a big, big batch to have enough casein, and it's a drink you can just like pour easy like that. And when you have a busy bar, it helps a lot with the volume. So that one is basically, you know, like Batavia Rx, Yamazaki. Um, that's a drink I did a few years ago when the, the Japanese whiskey are not super crazy expensive that they are there now. And you mix everything together and have a thing super clarified. The one you have right now is called the Wimbledon Milk Punch. So basically, that's, I'm going to talk a bit later, but it's like a concept, concept drink. I wanted to do a milk punch, but uh, with Wimbledon. And Wimbledon, 
what they do is they, um, they eat like strawberries with uh, cream. It's like this stuff there, and uh, it's really good. So I wanted to do like something more like on the English side. So we took some uh, some jeans, some Earl Grey tea, uh, cream, strawberries, and a little bit of rum to give some kick, and then spices as well, and then clarify it, and that's what you have. You can like some some people start doing um, meal punch bars. Like uh, there's a place um, in New York called Forest Point, I think, where they have a meal punch menu. It's pretty cool. Yeah, Forest Point. Yeah, it's good. Tongbu and jelly. Tongbu and jelly is again from travels. When you go to Hong Kong, you have uh, it's called um, uh, Hong Kong milk tea. So Hong Kong milk tea is like over steep milk, uh, uh, over steep tea. So they take a lot of tea, put it together, and then they aerate it. You've seen, I'm sure you've seen a video where they aerate the tea like that. They put. Uh, so I wanted to do like something like that, but one more like with flavors uh, and stuff we had. So we took Spanish brandy, black salt rum that gives. An, a very strong uh, like chocol chocolate and coffee taste to the drink. And we did a Tom and Jerry butter. So this is basically a twist of the Tom and Jerry and the Hong Kong milk tea. So we obviously did the tea, we put condensed milk, put the butter together on the throat of the drink and put it in a, that cup that's very New York. And uh, yeah, and that again works very well. Other inspiration, uh, cuisine. So you know like, Again, you know, you all go to restaurants, you all try um, a lot of good stuff, and, and it would be a shame to not use all the stuff you have in your mouth, all the flavors into drinks. Because for me, I mean, that's only my opinion, but um, it's good to have what you have on the shelves, but it's good to, to play with more flavor, because we all know now it's, you know, the bartender community is way better than, than before. Everyone is more creative, and... And you know we all like daiquiris and negronis and all the stuff like that, but I think it's it, when you can push further into flavors, it's more interesting for either you or the customer, and um, and that's what they, they do in the restaurant. They do in cooking. You know when you have like you go to um, a molecular place or like tasting menu where they play with flavors and and gives layers of drinks and la layers of flavors, and that's so interesting. So why not do it into drinks? And why not using what you have in the restaurant? Fully drinks. So like, once I had, I was in in, a, in per se in, a, in New York, and they have like, um, a, you know, they give like dark chocolate uh, in the end of the meal, and one was into a shiitake mushroom. And I was like, fuck, that's so good, like shiitake mushroom and chocolate. And I was, I would have never thought about the combination flavor before, so I wanted just to put it in a drink, and I did um, an old-fashioned twist, infusing the shiitake mushroom in a scotch, and doing a maple syrup with coconuts, black walnut bitters. Pedro Juanes Vistos, you know, all those flavors are very like chocolatey and goes well together. Now, you know, like an example, here you're not, ab you're not able to do infusions. What you, you could do for that kind of drink is do, um, you know, when you, free when you do uh, ice cubes, just do, an, um, you cook uh, shiitake mushroom and then freeze it. So you have that strong shiitake flavors and then you stir your, your old fashioned like you will do normally and you, you will bring all the shiitake uh, flavors into the drinks. So that's an example of stuff where oh, it's, it's good to uh, to do an infusion, but again, you can play with um, with, uh, with with what you have to to bring the same kind of combination. Macronation allegory is the the drink you're gonna have after, I think. Yeah, so that's uh, that's another technique that's super cool. It's um, but you know it's a lot to do again, so it's. But you know, I've been to I've been to a lot of amazing bar in the last two days, and I've seen a lot of good drinks. And I know some are like infused. I don't on the menu it's written yeah yeah yeah, but it's I know you're doing you. So yeah, do it under the. <laughs> I'm not judging. <laughs> Just do it. That's it's um, it's a sous vide drink. So basically, one of the um, you know Phil Duff was talking about like the book you should read from Dave Arnold, and he's hundred percent right on that. It's an amazing book. Uh, another amazing book is from Tony Conigliaro, um, the one who opened 69 Corbucco in London. And those two books together talk about all those techniques, sous vide, robot, centrifuge, and very, very interesting. And what Tony did a few years ago, and he, and he actually cheated, and it was putting on the menu, uh, Bottle Edge Manhattan. And uh, he said like it was a four months uh, age Manhattan. I mean, the truth was, and then he changed it, it, it was not aging it in bottle for four months, he was cooking sous vide. Because when you cook sous vide a cocktail, let's take an example from Manhattan, 
you you take your you, so one of the rules is like when you, you when you do on sous vide, don't put bitters because you will get over bitter. But you put your your your, um, your vermouth and your rye whiskey. You put it together. You put it sous vide, and then you cook it for two hours. It's gonna it's gonna do the same that if you age it. So it's gonna let's say like the the cocktail is like a star, and uh, and you're gonna run all the, the the top. So it's gonna make the drink like more mellow, more like the flavors will mix together, and it's gonna be very 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 good. And you can just do it, putting sous vide and cooking for two hours or one hour. You can play with it according to the flavor, and that's very interesting. And that drink is the same. It's like um, so basically, the, the idea is to cook, but with pandan leaves. Yeah, what temperature? Oh, the temp so the temperature I use is uh, 52.5. It's uh, I didn't. It's a Tony uh, Tony stuff. Uh, I, I worked. Uh, I was supposed to open a bar with Tony uh, um, three years ago. We looked for a place in London for for about eight months, and um, and it's so. It, you know, you have to think about like the what the the temperature does to the flavors and to the the, the alcohol as well. And 52.5, it's, it's the good balance when you do with alcohol. If you do syrups, you can go higher, according to the flavors you're gonna have, we're going to use. Because obviously, there's some flavor that react very well or not well at all with the heat. So that's, you know, it's a particular case that you have to, to try, uh, try yourself. But yeah, uh, to be honest, like, yeah, 52.5 is, uh, is a good uh, rule of thumb for, for playing with, um, with sous vide uh, cooking. With alcohol, so that one is going to be a one uh, again a fat wash. So you take the rum, you take coconut oil, leave it for one hour, leave it infused, freeze it, strain it, boom, coconut, so good. Pandan leaves, it's my favorite flavors. Like you, I never do a menu. It's it's very hard, but never do a menu without pandan. It's just like it's it's a leaf that you find it's um, in Asia, Philippines, Malaysia. Um, Thailand, and they, you all you all tried before. If you see those cakes that are green, that's pandan. That gives a very nutty aroma. That gives a long finish. And the drink, when you're gonna have it, you're gonna see. You're gonna have like the rum and the coconut and the shinar, and then it stops, and then psh, it starts again. A long finish of pandan, and that's amazing. And only pandan can do that. And I'm in love with pandan. I could do like my bed with pandan leaves. I love it. <laughs> And you know, when I travel, you know, a lot of, lot of places, are, they don't have pandan, so I have to bring it. And uh, after the airport, I go to the hotel and I open my suitcase, and the smell of the pandan in the room, oh, so good. <laughs> so that's, that's just a twist of the, the right hand, or uh, rum, shina, I mean, like, amaro, vermouth. Cook sous vide, pandan, uh, you're going to have it in a, in a short time, it's a, it's a pretty good drink. Micronesian and Rigori, why? Because like uh, uh, Micronesian uh, pandan grows in Micronesia a lot. Concepts. So concepts. Uh, no, another one. Cuisine. So that's uh, again, like, you know, it's uh, the flavor combination that you have a lot. If you, you have it here, Roquefort, blue cheese, figs, cognac. It's very, you know, it's obvious. But why not put it in a drink? And that's what I did. This is a Harvard, a Harvard cocktail, a twist of the Manhattan. It's a uh, Cognac, sweet vermouth, bitters. But we did a fig, uh, fig vermouth and we did a blue cheese bitter. And for the people who, who came last night, I did a guest chef at Le Lab, blue cheese bitter is amazing. It, it's, it's, you you do just do a fat wash. You, put the, you blend it and then freeze it and gives a very strong uh, roquefort uh, or blue cheese taste. And, and all those, uh, those flavors went well together. So that's again, you know, like cuisine, everything you eat every day, everything you see on the menu, gives you inspiration for stuff you can put in a drink, then it's according to your taste to balance it, you know? Concepts. Concept with the meat punch is the stuff you just had before. So basically, you can create drink according to a concept. You don't have to, you don't play with flavors, but say, oh, Wimbledon is cool, tennis, boom, boom, English, tea, uh, strawberries, cream, done. Books. That's actually a pretty cool book that um, a lot of people have. And um, so it's called the Flavor Thesaurus from uh, Nicky, Nick Segnit. And he gives you a panel. Um, yeah, actually, you can see it a little bit here. But, you know, he's going he's gonna to give you, like, an example of flavors like apple and cinnamon and stuff like that. So it's a very good help when you start bartending, when you say, when you're like, oh, yeah, I want to make an apple drink, but uh, with what? Or, and that gives you a lot of examples. 
It's not going to give you like crazy example like uh, shiitake mushroom and chocolate, but it's going to give you the, the basic one. Is, and, and, and I think it's a good start if you want to, to make your drinks, if you want to start playing with flavors, with syrups and infusion. If you want the reference of the book, just ask me after, I'll give it to you. Uh, one example of stuff I did, you know, from that book, you know, like tequila, pear, the caramel, salt caramel, mezcal, like it's very like simple stuff, but goes well, very well together, chili as well. Um, okay. After that, um, oh. I talk, but I don't drink. Yeah, so that's a drink with the coconut and the pandan. You'll see the finish is uh, pretty cool. Co-workers. And that's, that's an example again. I see so many bartenders, they go to bar, they don't even look at the menu. They say, ah, give me a Negroni. Fuck Negroni, you know, it's really like, it's why, why so many drink that, try what you have, what, what people do on the menu. And I know sometimes you say, hey, I want a I want dry drink, I want but you can make a Negroni at home, it's so easy. Try what people do in their bar, read the menu and try it. You don't like it, just try one drink and then order your Negroni, but at least try it. And it's going to give you some time, it's going to be, oh, that, that combination is good. Or I want to do a, a drink similar. Please do it, because I see so many people, like, I, I see people at Maze, they come to the bar, they open the menu, so, yeah, give me a Manhattan. Try it, try it, just try it, please. And if you don't like it, I'll make the Manhattan. That's an example of drink. Um, there's a bar in New York called Van Dagia. It is actually a pretty cool bar that closed, I don't know why, but it's... And they had a drink with uh, aquavit and, uh, and pineapple and beer. And it was one of the... One of the first cocktail I've seen with top up with beer, you know, like like you're gonna do a gin tonic, but you top up with beer, a gin fizz, you top up with beer. And it was the, for me, that was the first that did it, and I was like, wow, that's so good. Me, I hate beer, I hate it, I never drink beer. But that drink, the, the drink I had at Van Dag, was really really good. They give a, a bitter finish that was amazing. So give me inspiration to do that drink. To be honest, like I will never have thought about doing that without trying what they had on the menu. Same for l'Americain, that was a bottle drink. So basically, back again for the Negroni, um, but that was yeah, actually an Americano. So when I went to a place called um, Grazier, it's a pizza place in Paris, they had a Negroni with, um, I think it was gin infused, it was not thyme, but rosemary. And it was a, a toasted walnut Campari and, uh, and artichoke infused uh, noy. And that was so good, it was so good. So I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do it. And I'm uh, American also, that was like um, a bottle drink, carbonated, you know, like you, you dilute it directly, carbonate it, close it. And that's actually very good for your bar as well, if you want to do volume, because when people order it, you just like, and that's it. And then intuitions. The intuitions, for me, it will be like the last step, uh, when you start playing, when you would drink a lot in bars, and you start like doing like your, your own stuff, uh, Pisco, Rebus, it's like just start putting drinks, like stuff like you, you'll never think and, and it all goes well together. Uh, shrubs, I mean like everyone does shrubs here now, it's a, for me it's a very cool thing. Um, every menu I do is with a shrub as well, playing with vinegars is very interesting. Mikulov Soro, another one, you know, like just playing with flavors. And no advice, you know, like again, <coughs> Sorry. So um, before before starting creating your own menus and doing so crazy, because I see I see so many bartenders, you know, like they don't even know what remember the main or they don't know the classics, and they start trying to do crazy stuff and fusion. And, and no, don't do that. Uh, start from the beginning. Start knowing your classics, knowing your customers, and then you can start playing with uh, with the flavors. And and in the end, you know, like the um, the skeleton of the drinks. You're gonna use that all around. You know, like if you do a twist of a daiquiri, it's a twist of a daiquiri. If you don't know what a daiquiri is, you can't know. Uh, you can do a twist of a daiquiri. It's got the same. You know, you can sometimes you can trick drinks, just twisting a little bit the flavors or infusions one of the components, and and play with that. Again, be curious. Try what people have on the menu. Read. We have excess of information now that we didn't have before. When I start bartending. I didn't have all this information. I had to go to bars and steal the menu instead of read. Now everything is online, it's amazing. So use that. 
be patient. Uh, again, like when I start doing the, um, when I start working in New York at Drum in 2010. I was like, fuck, how did they do to, to do create all the drinks? I was like, I will never be able to do that. And, uh, and then at some point it came and it goes and you build your stuff and you do like more crazy stuff. And, and again, so don't, don't be discouraged. It's like you do an unbalanced drink at the beginning, just try. It's all about, you know, balance in the end. That, you'll know that. Mr. Potato Head. This is, this is, a balanced drink. It doesn't look like, no? It's a balanced drink. You're gonna know it later. So basically, imagine the cocktail, and I didn't create that, actually. I think it's Phil Ward or Joaquin Simo? Yeah. Phil Ward, yeah, it's Phil Ward who did that. Basically, that's, you know, the heart of the, the, the potato, the heart of the cocktail is the, the spirit, the main spirit. And then you have the balance. You have an ear, it can be amaro, you have the, the, the arm, it's gonna be like the lemon and stuff like that. And when you create a drink yourself, you want that. You want to arrive at a balanced drink, whatever. You have like, imagine you have a Little Italy, which is a twist of the, the Manhattan, and you have Shina. If you take up the Shina, put like another Amaro in it, put Zucca or whatever, but, because if you don't balance your drink, you'll have that. <laughs> That's not a balanced drink. Because you start playing with all the stuff and you put it together and then it doesn't taste good. And you can see that on menu, so that's not good. I mean, or shoot it. You get the same effect of alcohol. That's what I do when I don't like a drink. <laughs> Vacuum machine. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna be um, quickly with the. Um, I'm gonna go quickly with the, the stuff you can play with. I think now everyone uh, knows that, you know, the vacuum machine is very, very good friend of yours if you want, you want to do infusions or, or syrups. It accelerates the time you're going to do stuff. Um, we actually use a vacuum machine for those cocktails. It's, um, it's a very, very, very good. And here you don't have the problem we have in New York. In New York, it's prohibited to have that. It's not prohibited, but you need a, a license that's like $10,000 or something like that. It's just like it's crazy. So if you do like stuff sous vide in your bars, you better hide it or you do it at home. But a restaurant, because in New York, they consider that if you have that machine, you use it for, for cooking. And you know, there's uh, several uh, rules to it. Like if you do it with meat, you can keep the, the bacteria inside and it grows while it's sous vide, and then you serve it to customers and like, they get infection. So yeah, it can be tricky, but the bars, we, we don't use it for meat and stuff like that, and it's impossible to have that. And it's not like a, it's not, um, a stuff that's so costly, you know, it costs $1,000 maybe, and you, 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 can, you can really, really, really uh, accelerate your syrups and stuff like that. Because after that, when you, cook, when you put it in the vacuum machine, then you cook sous vide. And that's act actually a bain-marie, it's a picture that a a piece that costs around like $2,000 as well, but now they have the system that you must do, it's called the ANOVA. So ANOVA is as well an immersion circulating system, then you don't need like, you don't have the whole stuff, but you have like a bag, uh, like um, a container, and you just put the, the, you just put water and put the ANOVA system in it, and it's, it creates the water with the temperature you want, and it costs like 170 euros, buy it. It's amazing, it's a very good, uh, very good um, friend for your bar. Bricks matter. So that, that again, like F Philip was talking about it before, it's very hard this day to have consistency in your, in your place. Why? Because the syrups, uh, the, the lemon juice are not the same, the orange juice are not the same. And when you do your own syrups, it's going to be the problem. I'll give you an example with a pineapple syrup. Pineapple are never the same. It's going to be sweet, it's going to be sour and stuff like that. So if you're like, oh, I'm doing pineapple syrup, I'm super happy, but then you receive two different pineapple, and you're gonna have two different syrup uh, in the end, and you're gonna have two different drinks. Bricks meter, pH meter. Two is two stool that gonna help you to have consistency into everything you do. The bricks meter, basically, you just put a little bit of drop of the, the syrup here, and it's gonna calculate the, the amount of sugar you have in your syrup. So let's say you do a pineapple syrup again, and uh, in the end, the thing is super sour. You're gonna have like, oh, the brick's gonna be, 45, 
well, if you have a super sweet pineapple, it's going to be 55. It's going to be two different syrups and two different drinks. With that, you can adjust. So let's say like the pineapple is very dry. You say, oh, fuck, it's 45. You put more sugar, 50, consistency. With the pH meter, it's going to be the same, but for acidity. You have like a, we do it with orange juice for the cocktail. Because orange juice are never the same. So let's say you have like an orange, like super sweet, but not sour. So put, he was talking, Philip, about like acids. Um, when you bring acid to drinks, just put acid in it. You put, so basically for lemon, lime, grapefruit, orange, it's called citric acid. So that's the acid that's on. So you, you're going to add as, uh, those acid in it. It's going to, the pH is going to go up, uh, go down, actually. And it's going to keep the same consistency. When you have uh, apples, it's going to be malic acid. So you can play with malic acid. You have uh, grapes, it's going to be tartaric. So playing with those acids that are not that expensive, you can really uh, keep a consistency. And more than that, more than that, and he was telling about it later, um, uh, uh, before, you can play with other ingredients. What we do, for example, is like I have a drink that I don't want to use lemon and lime all the time because it, most of people think it's the only way to bring acidity to your drink. It's not. And if you play with an um, apple, don't put lemon, don't put lime, just put apple juice, but bring the acidity, so you add malic acid in it to bring the pH around 2, 2.3, that's what lemon and lime are. Then you can use that juice to give acidity to your drinks. You can do the same with orange juice. You can do the same with, uh, yeah, uh, pineapple juice, and gives you know more ideas to your drinks, and that you're allowed to do because there's no infusion, so it's a good way. And it doesn't; it costs like hundred dollars, so it's not um, it's not very expensive. So that's it for me. Um, thank you for listening, especially after those <laughs> long drink drinking. If you have any question, please come to me. I have uh, cards of the bars. I'm here. Thank you.